What do we normally do if we want to grow a beautiful garden full of flowers? We pay a visit to our local garden center and purchase expensive assortments of blooming perennial plants, or we limit our flowering gardens to inexpensive trays of annual flowers. Sometimes we can even grow them from seeds. But I thought, what if I try something different this year? What would happen if I collected seeds from various wildflowers or from cultivated flowering plants which produce their own seeds, whose seeds are not commonly available even from trusted suppliers? What we see in garden centers come from nature. Of course, many flowers there are hybridized, modified, patented, and sold as a special variety under different names, but they're all just a progeny of the same wild cultivated plants, and they can be easily found in nature. I would like to share with you my crazy experience. I'm going to say that it was actually quite challenging to grow something that is not commonly grown from seeds. So I found one in nature when I was collecting some medicinal herbs. I hurt myself on a strong prickly leaf, and I thought to myself, this plant is a real monster. The flowers looked very familiar, and I realized that I've worked with them before creating bridal bouquets. This is globe thistle. It is in the aster family. The large spiky flowers appear in early summer and last up to eight weeks. They are perennials, so the plant will make long-lasting garden companions with hardy habits and minimal care. I memorized the exact location and came back in November to collect the seeds. These seeds need a stratification period, so I kept them for a few weeks in my fridge, just in a cotton fabric bag. I planted the seeds in March, and my first try failed because I didn't remove the seeds from the seed cover completely. So I decided to try again, and this time I removed the good-looking, firm seeds from the preserved flower heads, and I planted them. Half of them sprouted very quickly. I lost some of them due to the delicacy. So I would say that the seed selection is needed for this plant, as well as for many others. But I did successfully grow four strong seedlings very quickly. I hope my pollinators will love them. They can also be different colors. The next one is the sea holly plant. Have you ever seen sea holly seeds anywhere in a garden store or in a catalog? Because I could never find any. So I decided to collect them from the plants I use for floral decor. I planted them in March and to my surprise, most of them sprouted very quickly with a great sprouting rate. They were very easy to take care of. Sea holly is a hardy perennial and it is drought resistant. It can grow successfully on very poor soil because it has a long taproot, which will allow the plant to get nutrients and water. Sea holly has beautiful, attractive, and unique blue flowers. It is an amazing addition to any garden. They started growing very quickly when I planted them in the open ground. Another drought resistant, carefree, hardy perennial that is not commonly grown from seeds is Russian sage. The genus was named by the Russian botanist Karolin in around 1840 after B.A. Perovsky, who discovered this plant and brought it to Russia from one of his expeditions around Central Asia. So the plant is not native to Russia, nor is it a sage. The sage reference probably comes from the characteristic sage aroma given off when the leaves are crushed. I collected faded flowers from a city park in late November and kept it in a fabric bag. Then I gave them a four-week stratification period in my refrigerator. The seed sprouting rate was high and the seedlings grew very strong and disease resistant. I planted them in the open ground in May and I can't wait to see the clouds of blue lace flowers in my garden. In the same city park flower bed together with the Russian sage or just in the wild I can find and collect seeds for another tall blue colored flower, Veronica spicata or spiked speedwell. It's not commonly grown from seeds. Sometimes in the late fall, the flower heads will fade and spikes full of seeds will form instead. It is the right time to collect seeds and then store it in a cool and dry place. This species is native to Northern Europe and Asia. Veronica is a genus of flowering plants within the Plantagenaceae family. They are commonly known as speedwell or gypsy weed. The flowers typically bloom from mid-June to August. The flowers are attractive to bees and butterflies, so I really wanted to try, and I found this one to be challenging. 
The seedlings were very delicate, and I lost a number of them. But I did manage to grow a few. When Veronica is established, it becomes practically carefree and a very hardy perennial. Speedwell can be white or purple in color. Nature is full of discoveries, and I'm always looking to try something new and different from traditional year-by-year -year garden center hybrid selections. Do you know that it's so simple to grow wildflowers from seeds? And many of them aren't just going to add a unique look to your garden and attract pollinators, but they're also medicinal plants with very powerful properties. Yes, I am talking about St. John's wort, or Hypericum perforatum. It's a little shrub with beautiful cheery yellow flowers that have a burst of long showy stamen in the center. The blossoms last from midsummer until fall and they are followed by colorful berries. St. John's wort doesn't really require any hard work at all. I normally collect them as a medicinal herb from August to September. And I thought maybe I should try to grow one. I checked for the presence of tiny seeds and I planted them in a tray with others. I didn't have many seedlings sprout. Maybe just some of the seeds weren't ready at the time that I collected them. But I did manage to grow a few. St. John's wort is a hardy perennial and it is drought resistant. And it is just a beautiful, perfect flowering plant. Another medicinal flowering plant that is actually very easy to grow from seeds is oregano. I can buy these seeds from an herb selection in a regular box store or a garden center. But I have found oregano plants with flowers in wild park areas. Oregano often escapes from people's gardens and it can easily be found in parks around suburban areas. So I'm going to crush my dry oregano and sprinkle them in a tray. Oregano's sprouting rate is really high, but the seedlings are delicate and they grow very slowly in the beginning. So once it's time for me to plant them outside, they still look very tiny. But after the oregano is established, they become practically carefree, hardy, and drought-resistant plants. To stimulate the growth of the green parts, I need to trim them. But if I want the fragrant flowers to attract pollinators, I need to let them fully bloom. Developed near snowy Mount Shasta in Northern California, Shasta daisies are the result of a quadruple hybrid cross. The parents, oxide daisy, English field daisy, Portuguese field daisy and Japanese field daisy were crossed over a period of 17 years by horticulturalist Luther Burbank starting in 1884. Finally, in 1901, the Shasta daisy was introduced to home gardeners. It looks very similar to the oxeye daisy, but the flowers are much larger. Shasta daisies are easy to propagate from seed and by division. And Remember to note that as a hybrid, the seeds saved from existing plants may not grow true to the parent. Shasta daisies easily escape from home gardens and can often be found amongst fields and parks around suburban areas. My collected seeds of Shasta daisies sprouted very fast, they grew very densely, and I have many of them to plant around and share with other gardeners. In the same areas, I can find the parent plant of Shasta daisy, the oxide daisy, or Leucanthemum vulgare. It is a perennial herbaceous species with a creeping root system. It is native to Europe, and it was introduced into the United States as an ornamental in the 1800s. I need to be careful growing oxide daisy in my garden because they are an aggressive invasive species. Once established, it can spread rapidly by means of roots and seeds into undisturbed meadows and woodland areas. It forms dense stands that tend to displace native vegetation, especially wildflowers. But on the other hand, the oxide daisy has strong medicinal properties and can be used for conditions of the respiratory tract, it can be used for wound healing, and many other purposes. Black hellebore is originally a wild species native to Central Europe, but today it is naturalized in many more regions where it occasionally pops up in forest settings, in low altitude mountain ranges, and can be found during regular hiking trips. This plant is widely cultivated now and used for hybridization to obtain other color variations. These hybrids can normally be found in local garden centers, but they are sterile. They do not produce any seeds, but they can be propagated by division, and they are for personal use only because they are patented. 
I came across this amazing plant once and now my garden is full of this evergreen beauty. The flowers first appear when snow starts melting in early spring and turn from white to green and last until July. The plant is self-seeding and in May I have a lot of hellebore seedlings ready to be transplanted. Black hellebore is dormant during the hot summer months. It actively grows during the cold winter months. This winter rose loves shady places in the garden and is moderately drought resistant. Another one is lupin. I can definitely find seeds of lupin in the store, but if I'm lucky and I keep my eyes open while driving, I can find some growing on the side of the road or on the side of the highway. In fall time, I can collect seeds in large amounts, and I can generously share these seeds with my neighbors and grow some for myself. Lupin seedlings have high sprouting rates and they grow very fast. They start blooming on the second year and then every year after that. It's a good idea to keep lupin in some areas of the garden because like all legumes, lupins take nitrogen from the air, turn it into stored nitrogen in the form of nodules on their roots using nitrogen fixing soil bacteria and this improves the fertility of the soil. Another famous monarch butterfly host plant is the common milkweed. I don't even need to plant seeds in trays in early spring for these plants because the seeds can be placed into open ground in the fall time. They will appear on their own in May after the winter stratification period. Common milkweed is an eye-catching flower. They can be used as a background flower, especially for pollinator gardens. Milkweed is also hardy and drought resistant. It is a perennial. The flowers bloom for several weeks, filling the garden with a very pleasant fragrance. And finally, another medicinal wild, beautiful perennial flower is yarrow. You can grow yarrow from seeds from just using crushed preserved herbal tea flower heads. This tea is used by Native Americans to cure stomach disorders and it's made by steeping the leaves. The sprouting rate wasn't great. It was probably due to premature flower collection, but I did manage to grow a few healthy plants. Yarrow can be found in garden centers, but the species that are used in traditional gardens have generally been superseded by cultivars with specific improved qualities. In other words, they are genetically manipulated and can present with different color variations. It is really easy to find wild yarrow in parks and meadows and grow these strong perennials in your flower garden. So my dear gardeners, I hope you enjoyed my collection of flowers that you can grow from seeds to make your garden look different, unique, not traditional, and absolutely free. So if you enjoyed, please subscribe and thank you so much for watching.